So Meta recently released its competitor to Twitter called Threads. And last week I posted on Threads to ask for your questions and I'm gonna answer them in today's YouTube video. How do you overcome burnout in photography? I think the best way to overcome burnout in photography is to just take a break. Content feels like it always needs to be made. Photos always need to be made. You should always be practicing craft, but if you are really tired, you need to rest, get more sleep, take a break, wait to the point where you actually feel like you want to create again. And when you feel that feeling, few things that you can try is use a totally different medium. So if you're doing digital, try film. Also try to use maybe a different focal length that you're not comfortable with, or try to revisit a place that you haven't been to for a long time, but you are familiar with it. That's one of the things that helps me kind of get jump started is go to a place that I like to photograph, but I haven't been there for a long time. And I'm showing up with a different type of camera, different type of medium, or different focal length and that forces me to kind of creatively jump start things what do you do to take a break from creativity that allows you to be refreshed and inspired for when you go back to create thing that works the best for me is to just stop and really do something that's totally different than photography or videography and the two things that i've been doing to really feel refreshed is one to build lego kits and the other thing that i've been doing a lot is playing video games so play ps5 a lot of racing games gran turismo it's important to find a hobby that is not video or photo centric some other hobby outside of your craft is really important so that you can fully disconnect to have fun how do you balance being a dad and a creator i feel like this is something that's continuously being worked on with myself but i think the way that i actually balance it is i get very 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 efficient about when i actually create content when i create instagram posts i create multiple at a time and i schedule them when i create youtube videos i script two of them out and then I record them back to back. And I think it's being able to kind of ideate in advance and batch create in one time and then schedule and put it out. A lot of people think like, how do I put out so much content? It must be take me a long time. When it comes to content creation, I always spend an hour or two at a time, like usually late at night or early in the morning to do this. It's something that I've gotten very efficient at because I had to be very efficient at it because I was taking care of my kids and now I'm working a full-time job. And the other trick is to be very on top of uh, communication with whoever is helping you with childcare or communicating to your kids or to your partner. That is gonna be the top thing that you need to work on in order to kind of make this all work because you will need some support to be able to create this stuff while you also have kids to take care of. What can someone who's not practiced in content creation do to get themselves practiced and developed in content creation? The key for content creation is that you have to just really start before you're ready. So if you're making YouTube videos videos, TikToks, Instagram reels or anything and you're doing video, the biggest trick I've learned is to just pretend that there's somebody else on the other side of the camera that you're talking to. A close friend, maybe you three years ago and teaching yourself wisdom. That is the easiest way to get started. Just hit record and start talking to that person. What are your business or freelance mistakes that you wish you could have done differently when you started? So there are three things that I wish I did differently when I started my business. The first is I actually wished I just had a separate business banking account. So having a checking account for your personal finance and then having a separate bank account just for your business is super crucial because it allows you to monitor the health of your business to seeing what goes in and what goes out. I think having my money kind of like quote unquote mixed for a long time wasn't an accurate way for me to see if my business was actually making money year to year profitably. The second thing that I would do differently is read business books. I didn't really start learning about business until 2019 and I started my photography business in 2013. So that was like six years of me just just kind of figuring things out based on other photographers. But what I learned is if you really learn about business and read books about business or learn about creative entrepreneurship, there's so much more that you can implement so that you can be ahead of the curve in terms of being profitable, establishing yourself as an expertise in the field, and also just making money. I think if you have a business or you're freelancing, you're out there to, to generate profit. And I feel like I was kind of late to the game on that. The last thing that I would do is really start building my SEO presence earlier on in my career career with blogs. And that takes me to today's video sponsor, Squarespace. The cool thing about creating a website through Squarespace is that you can create blogs that can be backlinks to your work, 
to your educational posts or to even like YouTube videos or Instagram content. I really wish that I had created blogs that could document every single thing that I've done throughout my career. That way I can build SEO presence to attract new clients. And a cool thing about Squarespace is that you can insert keywords into each blog. You can also insert SEO key terms within the blog itself. And that allows you to be searched by prospective clients, prospective audience members so that you could build your community and also generate new leads. My favorite thing about Squarespace is being able to check out the analytics to see the traffic from day to day and also to see which content page is actually performing the best. Being searchable is really underrated and overlooked by a lot of photographers who are just trying to build social media presences. So I think building a website on Squarespace to put your photos on there with the correct metadata that has searchable terms on it is probably the one thing that will get you the leg up ahead of other photographers who are just focusing on building a social media presence. And when you're ready to do that, head to squarespace.com slash Reggie Ballesteros to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this Q&A video. What's your comfort food? I would say my comfort food is actually in and out So I went to school um, to study mechanical engineering in UC San Diego, but I grew up in the Bay Area. And every time I would return home uh, for summer break or winter break or something like that, I would fly to the Oakland airport. And when my parents would pick me up, we would go straight to in and out And that was kind of my signal that yes, we're finally home. Which experience do you love more, film or digital and why? Honestly, <laughs> I think a lot of people will say they like film more, but I think for me, film is kind of like a refreshing, and kind of novel type of photography experience, but I still feel most locked in, most creative, really in control of my craft using the digital experience specifically with mirrorless. Using the Fujifilm X100V, the Fujifilm X70, and the Fujifilm X-C5 are probably the most creative tools that I'm using right now. I've also been using the Ricoh GR3 and the GR3X. I still feel gravitated toward the digital side just because my mind works through iteration. Being able to iterate the live preview, I check it and perfect it is something that keeps me most efficient and most creative whereas film I can have to take the photo and have to wait a couple weeks and I think while that is the beauty of film and it helps us be very creative and take more risks and put more on the line I still think I prefer the digital workflow better. What is the best everyday camera in 2023? This is a personal preference right to be honest the the best everyday camera is going to change depending on person to person there are two cameras that I think are the best everyday camera in 2023 the first is going to be the X100V if you can find it, if you can buy it. The X100V, I think, still is pound for pound one of like the best tools for its weight and its size and the image quality that it has, as well as the aesthetic, the film simulation, the raw image quality. I think as a whole entire package, it can even do a little bit of video. I mean, that's the best thing. Um, outside of that, I really do think just an iPhone is probably the best everyday camera at this point because you're going to have it all the time with you. You're going to take a lot of photos and video, and I think the one thing is that I love the best about an iPhone is that it has the photos memories feature so it reminds you of different memories that you may have forgotten because it's on your camera wall and I think that by far is my favorite feature about it because it's already kind of cataloging different memories that you may want to remember showing me like trips that I've taken with my family or my kids you know over a span of a certain amount of time those are really cool what do you think is a piece of advice that constantly gets overlooked by new photographers and content creators I think a piece of advice that a lot of photographers still ignore is learn how to find good light. And a lot of people confuse this with low light is bad light. But the truth is, if you know how to find good light in terms of the direction and quality, you can use a small amount of light, a low light situation at night and still get very flattering results if you can learn how to find light. And the best way to do that is to learn how to find directional light. And still to this day, photographers still obsess over low light sensor performance, large apertures, cameras, autofocus, all this stuff, film simulation recipes presets and they still don't know how to find nice high quality light to use for their specific creative application. As a photographer, do you want to be remembered by your YouTube or is there other work you wish to publish in the future? Down the road, if I had kind of like my dream fulfilled of how I want to be remembered. I want to be remembered for the legacy or the library of photography education that I've left behind. So like the strobis, so David Hobby and how he has his large repository of 
off-camera lighting blog posts that teach everyone. I want to be known in that realm as someone that was a really great resource. How can you organically grow your audience and client base? The most efficient way to organically grow your audience at this point is to create social media content, specifically probably short form content or long form YouTube content are probably the most, I think, appropriate ways to do it right now. In order to do that and be successful at social media, you have to focus on three things with your content. You have to educate or entertain or inspire. You have to be doing one of those three things or try to do as many as you can. But without that, you won't be providing value to an audience member. And the only way an audience member will even decide to follow you is if you provide value. That's the only way to kind of grow an audience in the simplest terms. It's not about the camera that you use. It's not about the type of shots that you do, how you talk, how confident you are in camera. Ultimately, it's just going about, do you provide value to your audience? And was it enough value for them to follow you? What is your favorite focal length or lens for taking photos of your kids? I would say that my favorite focal length for photographing my kids is there's two different ones. First is the 18 millimeter focal length or 28 in full frame. This is really for kind of documenting everyday life, getting both up close as well as pulled back um, for those like environmental shots. And then the other focal length that I really like is the 50 millimeter focal length or the 33 millimeter in Fujifilm. And this is more for kind of like those candid moments, those portraits of my kids, basically having a little bit of compression to the photo to make it feel less real and more kind of like a memory. If you want to check those two lenses out, 18 millimeter 1.4 and the 33 millimeter 1.4, I kind of go into this a little bit more and how it impacts how I photograph my family. What is the hardest photo you've had to take and how long did it take to get it? So there was always a photo I was trying to take in San Francisco City Hall for a wedding. And it was this photo that I had in mind, kind of like centered, very straight on, very geometric of a couple kissing inside of an elevator with the doors kind of like closing. It looks like it's very candid or like very lucky timing but the truth is I actually had to do multiple takes of this I think three or four or five like asking the couple to go in the elevator and opening it and closing it and then going up and down the elevator and trying to open the door and close it and hope that there was no one else in the elevator with them or no one walking by um, I want to say it took a span of like eight to ten minutes which in the realm of like taking a wedding portrait in a very constrained amount of time that's a lot of time to burn on one photo and even more so is I, I've been shooting shooting at San Francisco City Hall for I think four or five years and I didn't have the opportunity to photograph it until just like a couple years ago so it was a long time leading up to trying to get the opportunity to photograph this specific scenario. Do I prefer stage photos or candid photos? So in the workflow sense when it comes to documenting just what's going on I like candid photos. I like finding where the good light is for the good framing is and trying to position myself so that I take these types of photos. This is how I take most of the photos of my family. But when it comes to portraits, a lot of the things that look natural to clients that I've done for my wedding photography career, they were actually staged. So what I do is I try to find the good light, find the good framing and put the couple and actually micro pose their gesture where they put their hands, their how they stand up, how they face their nose, everything. And then I tell them to think about something, to talk about something, to do something. And that sense, that specific emotion, that a specific interaction is actually candid, but it's within kind of like a stage situation. And the last question is why do I post? Could it be because you like it or is there some other deeper reason? So the way that I approach posting on social media, especially on Instagram, is everything is an experiment and I'm learning as I go. I'm kind of building in public, so to speak. Um, so everything isn't just the most perfect thing. Sometimes it's something that I like, something I think it's valuable for other people or a combination of both or me just maybe just trying to do something completely different. I don't use my Instagram or social media like other people who's very, very polished and have a specific way to do it. For me, I approach my social media as what is inspiring to me? What is something that I think that I would like to share with the rest of the world? Or what is something that I think my audience would find very valuable and useful? And with that, if you made it all the way to the very end, I do want to know which camera view do you like to see first? The Ricoh GR3, the Ricoh GR3X, the Fujifilm X-T5 or the Fujifilm X-H2S? Let me know down in the comments.